Genesis chapter 6, verse 4. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. This is Dr. Narco Longo with the Florida Department of Magic. In this presentation, it will be shown that the land we today know as Florida was once inhabited by a forgotten race of giant men. Nowhere else in the world will you find a landmass so thoroughly peopled with men of extraordinary stature. Not only were these giants present at the time of so-called European arrival, but they were likely descended from the very titans who sculpted the megaliths, mounds, and waterways of this continent. The Spanish and French conquistadors of the 1500s matter-of-factly reported on the gargantuan stature of the men they encountered in the lands they called La Florida, bones belonging to the, quote, children of the dawn, as they were once termed by Florida's experts, were routinely uncovered in every corner of the state up until World War II. If all of this sounds silly or pseudoscientific, then I'm afraid you have fallen victim to the propaganda war waged upon us by the current scientific regime that seeks not only to undermine the wisdom earnestly passed down to us from ancient mythology and the great works of the world religions, but also to rob humanity of their pride, their essence, their divinity. As you will see, however, the evidence presented herein is not the product of biblical zeal or resentment for scientism, for much of what you are about to hear comes to us from the same mainstay publications which you, today, reliably get your news, weather, sports, etc. Yes, that's right. The presence of Florida's giants was once not a matter of belief. It was printed in America's reputable publications as archaeological certainty. It has only been since after World War II and the cementing of Arab-centric Darwinist propaganda into our school systems that the obvious truth has been obscured. The Smithsonian Institute, whose reputation 100 years ago was even worse than it is now, today denies the existence of any abnormally large human bones, despite the clear evidence that hundreds of such bones were, in good faith, sent to them for preservation and further research. These bones would never be heard of again. It is institutions of this sort, posing as benefactors to society, who are to blame for the thoroughness of this cover-up. Seeing ourselves at the dawn of the age of information, however, no amount of sabotage or censorship will longer be able to hold back the truth. So, without further ado, let us now set the record straight and restore to man's memory the Philistines of Florida, the Goliaths of the Glades, the Children of the Dawn. Now enjoy. Welcome to Florida, baby. Introducing Dr. Narco Longo. There were the giants famous from the beginning, that were of so great stature and so expert in war. Those did not the Lord choose, neither gave he the way of knowledge unto them, but they were destroyed, because they had no wisdom and perished through their own foolishness. Baruch chapter 3 verse 26 Part 1. Newspaper Articles 
The frequent discovery of extraordinarily sized human bones in Florida was reported on regularly in the newspapers of America until an abrupt halt to all giant-related stories which occurred around the year 1950. All of the following excerpts can be found yourself by accessing public newspaper archives. Let us now read a small selection of articles which demonstrate the prevalence of giant skeletons in every corner of Florida. The Tampa Sunday Tribune of Sunday, July 25, 1948, reported the following. Evidence of ancient Florida culture indicated in relics. Quote, Mr. Watson was active but meticulous in his efforts to unravel the story of Florida's earliest human inhabitants, the races who long antedated the Indians known to modern historians. He cites many evidences of an ancient culture, great cement cisterns, no doubt constructed for the storage of rainwater, canal systems, stone, for, stone foundations for structures, and he tells of the exhumation of a people of enormous stature, men who must have been at least seven feet tall, with large round teeth, worn but showing no indication of decay. The picture he presents of these prehistoric giants is similar to that I wrote long ago of the skeletons discovered in the burial place on Cypress Street near West Tampa. I am six feet tall, and several of these thigh bones which I measured are four to six inches longer than mine. Mr. Watson appears to have had personal contact with a character whose name has appeared many times in the stories of Florida. Discussing Florida's first prehistoric citizens, Mr. Watson makes the definite declaration that the earliest residents of the Florida Peninsula were not Indians, as is generally surmised. Indians built few, if any, mounds. They were too indolent. The Aborigines were a races of people called the Abenakis, children of the sun, long extinct tribes of sun worshippers who inhabited the coastal regions hereabouts six centuries ago. Some of them may have been descendants of the Aztecs of Mexico. Their mounds extended from Shell Beach in the north of Sarasota County, down the west coast of Florida, around and up the east coast. I have explored their mounds in great numbers all the way up the coast to North Carolina. Near Jupiter Lighthouse on the east coast of Florida, I found the skeletons of some of these men who were seven feet in height and whose jawbones contained the most remarkable specimens of molars I have ever seen. The Tampa Tribune of the 14th of February, 1925, reported the following. Skeletal remains of Florida giant is discovered. Discoveries of skeletal remains here, which may have an important bearing on theories of a giant race believed to have inhabited the Florida west coast before the coming of the Spaniards, were made this morning by workmen grading the island road near the Charlotte and Lee County lines. The discoveries include a skull and a femur or thigh bone, both so highly mineralized as to be almost pure silica and limestone, and kept from crumbling only by immersing in gelatin solution. Before measurements could be taken, the skull measured 23 centimeters in length and 18 in width, being about one-fourth larger than normal modern skulls, showing signs of fronto-occipital flattening, the artificial molding practiced by early Indian tribes. The length of the femur was 63 centimeters. The bones are thought to be those of a male, and indicated, according to local authorities, a probable height of not less than seven feet. The specimens are being prepared for shipment by A.C. Belvis of New York to the Smithsonian Institution which has already dispatched one expedition to Florida to excavate shell mounds on the west coast in search of proof of the giant race theory, with so far negative results. The Miami Daily News of February 14, 1925, also printed, Skull of Giant Starts Theory of Florida Race. Portions of large skeleton found by road graders near Boca Grande. Discovery of a skull one-fourth larger than that of the normal modern man, together with bones indicating a probable height of not less than seven feet, today led to speculation over theories of a giant race believed to have inhabited Florida before the coming of the Spaniard. The portions of the skeleton were found yesterday by workmen 
grading a road near the Charlotte and Lee County lines. This article, too, notes that, quote, the specimens are being prepared for shipment to the Smithsonian Institution, end quote. The St. Petersburg Times of Thursday, December 14th, 1922, reported the following. Big Mound Yields Giant Skeleton. Cedar Keys, Florida, December 13th. The remains of a gigantic aborigine was unearthed a few days ago in the midst of an Indian or oyster mound. The skeleton measured over nine feet in length, and the jaws were large enough to take in those of an ordinary person. Tons of oyster shells had to be removed before the skeleton was unearthed. The Miami Daily Metropolis reported the following on Saturday, May 6, 1922. The entire coastal region of Florida has been marked by mounds made by ancient Indians. The bays, sounds, estuaries, rivers, etc., forming a part of coasts, both Atlantic and Gulf, were the habitat of great quantities of shellfish, which evidently formed a large portion of the diet of the region's ancient denizens. North of the Caloosahatchee River is an immense conical mound. All down the Gulf Coast, even on the adjacent keys, are found the remnants of the feasts of the Aborigines. Right in Miami, or at least on the beach side, have such remains been found. On the Palm Beach side of Lake Worth, excavations have been made into one such. A few years ago, the mound at Yamato, the Japanese colony about 60 miles north, was explored by Charles Nelson Dutton, who is a private collector from the north. The Yamato tumulus is located about 600 yards from the ocean and is circular in form. The investigators pronounced the relics taken from it to be about 700 years old and to be the work of the Abenaki Indians, or the Children of the Dawn, as they have been poetically described. Due to the fact that they were sun worshippers and lived on the Sunrise Coast of North America, their first appearance being in the vicinity of North Carolina. Some ethnologists claim that the Abenakis were the first humans to tread the soil of Florida and were said to have been a race of giants, the stature of the men being about eight feet. This would bear out the statements of one of the earliest explorers of Florida that they found in the northern interior of Florida a tribe of very tall men. One writer says of them, quote, they were Pacific, industrious, intelligent, and perfectly moral. They were more nomadic in disposition than their later brethren of the redskin, and caribs in spirit, but not in caste. These people were artisans, craftsmen, sculptors, and created wonderful things in pottery. Their pottery has been found in this state in considerable quantity and is unique in the markings of their decorative art, much resembling a checkerboard in squares but now and then diamond-shaped. The county of Palm Beach, as well as others of the state, have hauled away many of these mounds for road building. At one time, other mounds were found in the locality, one at Jupiter being of horseshoe form. Some years ago, there was found in natural formation rock, near the bed of an ancient river, two human skeletons, one of each sex, also the bones of a saber-toothed tiger, they were exhumed from a depth of six or eight feet and attracted worldwide attention, starting a discussion, pro and con, as to the genuineness of the discovery. Some geologists pronounced the find to be at least 125,000 years old, antedating the pyramids of Egypt and having been deposited there before the glacial period laid its chill hand on North America. The Palm Beach Post of February 8, 1920, similarly published, Interesting Relics of Children of Dawn Found Near Yamato, Remains of Abenaki Indians Found in Large Mound in South End of County, Florida Rich in Relics of Prehistoric Ages. The Abenaki Indians were not especially known as mound builders, but their mounds along the eastern coast of Florida have furnished a vast quantity of valuable relics for the Smithsonian Institute of Washington and other museums of lesser fame. The Abenakis were the first human beings to tread the soil of Florida and were, 
It is claimed by men who have made a special study of matters pertaining to the lost race, a race of giants, attaining an average height of eight feet. They were pacific, industrious, intelligent, and perfectly moral. The Vero Press of June 22, 1922 covered the exact same story. The Tampa Tribune reported the following on the 12th of June, 1927. Quote, Evidence of tribal fights. Amateur archaeologists find remains of Florida giants near Fort Myers. Part of the trace of tribal fights among a race of giant Indians unearthed near Fort Myers. Amateur archaeologists from Fort Myers prowling around the deserted islands in Pine Island sound not many miles from St. James City. Once one of the most popular Florida winter resorts unearthed a new find which may be of value to scientists who delve into the bones of prehistoric inhabitants. Searching on a 44-acre island, owned by W. Stanley Hansen of Fort Myers and Estero, but inhabited by a lone white fisherman, examination of the bones by authorities revealed that as far as known, they are at least 500 years old and are the remains of a tribe of Indians known as the Caribs natives of the West Indies. It is a historical fact that in the period preceding the arrival of the Spaniards in Florida, there were isolated Indian tribes inhabiting the islands in this section. Judging from the size of the burial mounds, there were at least 250 bodies buried in each hill. Close examination of the skulls showed indications of tribal altercations, for many of them had been crushed and battered. The skulls, according to experts, are slightly larger than those of present races. The mouths and teeth are considerably longer and stronger than those known to dentists now. Authorities have advanced the theory that the size and shape of the teeth bear out the contention that the Indians of 500 years ago ate shell foods and cracked oysters and shellfish with their teeth. Specimens of teeth found in the mound are well preserved but show hard wear. The body bones are also much larger than those now known to the medical profession, and it has been declared that whatever race ran over the islands 500 years ago or more was a race of giants in size and strength. After being exhibited in Fort Myers for several days, the results of the excavation will be shipped to the Smithsonian Institution at Washington for further examination. Would you look at that? The Tampa Sunday Tribune of June 5, 1932, printed the following. Early Florida Giants' Bones Unearthed Near Fort Myers. Quote, Bones and many articles found on the little island, the captain said, indicated it has been inhabited by at least five different races, mound builders, prehistoric Indians, Spanish pirates, ancestors of the present Indians, and white persons. The island is dotted with shell mounds, the captain said, supposedly thrown up by a race of large people. The island is about 150 acres in area. The largest mound rises to a height of 49 feet above sea level. Among the articles found, Captain Damkohler said, were a broken gold bar valued at $250. Spanish coins, gold, beads, gold beads, silver bells strung in fives, a silver chain, oval picture frame with man's head and printed paper in old Spanish style. Captain Damkohler still has this paper, but so far has not been able to have it translated into English. Other articles found included an engineer's flat curve drawing instrument, probably English, broken sword and hilt, and a shield, a few three-inch cannonballs made of iron, bone or stone needles, shell plumb bobs, shell war clubs, shell farming tools, glass beads, and pottery. Skeleton remains of five or six different races have been found, and human bones are so plentiful at certain points that some can be picked up at almost every step. Pottery is also plentiful. Many legends have been handed down that this section of Florida was once inhabited by a wild tribe of Calusas, 
of large stature who have since become extinct. They are not ancestrally associated with the Seminoles, it has been proved. End quote. The Tampa Sunday Tribune of November 27, 1955, printed the following. Who were the Glades Giants? Were they born that way? Or did ancient Indians use bone-stretching formula? Quote, Not long ago, this page featured the significant discovery of giant human skeletons in Indian mounds in the Everglades. This discovery, very likely, was received by Indian researchers in an atmosphere of excitement. It resurrected interest in archaeology and fanned into the new life the theory that a prehistoric people inhabited Florida. Could these people have been descendants of the Mayas or Yucatan? Were they the early Calusas who chieftains ruled over 50 villages in the southern regions of Florida? Were the Calusas descendants of the Mayas of the Yucatan? Were they originally like the Mayas a race of cannibals. Who knows? No Spanish historians seem to classify Calusas as cannibals, but we know that some of the Indians of the Yucatan, possibly the Mayas, were cannibalistic. And reminder here, this is the article's words, not mine. But what of the giant frames of the Everglades skeletons? We have giant basketball and football players today, as well as giant African tribes. However, this phenomenon of giant Indians was reported by many early Spanish historians and attributed not to nature nor to heredity, but to an Indian craft or violence. Thus, Peter Martyr de Anguira, an Italian by birth but a Spaniard by adoption, a scholar, statesman, and chronicler, says that many tribes of Indians operated on the children while they were still in cradles and at the breast of their nurses. For a period of time, the osteopathic Indian specialists anointed the limbs of the babies with a decoction of certain herbs. These herbs rendered the children's bones soft as wax. The bones stretched until the children became well-nigh lifeless. Then the nurse covered the child with warm blankets and gave the infant her breast, fortifying her milk with nourishing food which she had consumed. These proceedings were practiced, chiefly, on the offspring of Indian chiefs and captains. Peter Martyr is not the sole reporter of the artificial production of tall Indian men and women. Antonio de Herrera, a chronicler who died in 1625 at the age of 68, writes as follows, quote, In another province they call Duar, the king was like a giant. His name was Dada. His wife and twenty-five children were huge. Being asked how they grew so large, they said that they had been given pudding stuffed with certain magic herbs. Others said that they stretched their bones when they were children. These reports of Peter Martyr, Herrera, and an unquoted report of the Inca, Garcilaso de la Vega, do not solve the delectable mystery of the giant skeletons of the Everglades. With regards to the theory of tracing the skeletons and the vanished Calusa history back to the perished Maya civilization, this much can be conceded, that it has no historical value, nor wit, nor sense. But what a sad gap the absence of relicable record of Maya relationship to Calusa has imposed on present-day historians. The Miami Daily News of Monday, June 8th, 1936 reported the following. Giant skeleton found on key. Remains of prehistoric man unearthed near Cape Sable. Reports that a treasure hunting party unearthed an eight foot skeleton with a skull three quarters of an inch thick on an island off Cape Sable were received today from Homestead. Crumbled parts of the skull were being brought to the University of Miami and an anthropologist will be asked to identify the race to which the prehistoric man belonged and the period he lived. Only the skull was brought to Homestead by the treasure-seeking party, which expects to return to the island later for the remainder of the skeleton. The skull, reports said, has a protruding chin, the forehead is low and receding, and ten teeth in the lower jaw took up all space available. 
The eye sockets, it was said, were unusually high in the forehead. Dr. A. M. Berger, homestead dentist, said the teeth were those of a human. The digging party unearthed the skeleton on a reputedly haunted island, where a large burying mound is reportedly located. The Palm Beach Post reported the following on Tuesday, February 28, 1922. Tribal Council of Seminoles held near prehistoric mounds. A tribal council of unusual significance has recently been held between the Cow Creek tribe of Seminoles, headed by Billy Smith, and the Big Cypress tribe, headed by Chief Tommy Tigertail. The first tribal conference of peace and understanding within the memory of the white race. The council fires were burning brightly these nights of the pale new moon near the township of La Belle on the upper Caloosahatchee River. The Seminoles having selected the identical spot for their memorable meeting where six to seven hundred years ago the last stand of the now extinct Abenaki Indians was made adjoining two of the most remarkable prehistoric mounds in all of Florida. In selecting this hallowed ground for their peace, council, and the settlement of almost feudal differences, the two tribes have been influenced by a peculiar religious or ritualistic endowment that flames within the breast of every full-blooded Seminole, for here it was that the final remnants of the once proud and peaceful people, the Abenaki, sun worshippers, or children of the dawn, passed over the great divide into the happy hunting grounds of eternal peace. On this spot, around which the council fires are burning, are a series of prehistoric fortifications erected by the Abenaki Indians, possibly at least 700 years ago. For the Abenaki people, whose skeletons recently unearthed in limeshell fortifications in Palm Beach County, denote the previous existence of a race of supermen seven to eight feet in height. And these strange, even mystical, aborigines have been extinct more than 600 years. These mounds were constructed, it is believed by investigators and experts from the Smithsonian Institution at Washington, as a set of fortifications for defense purposes and consist of two large breastworks, very high and running about a hundred feet in length. They are not far apart, and judging from the gradual effects of the elements, they have been worn away to about one half their original height. Just what strange motives influenced the Abenakis to construct such mammoth fortifications for defense purposes six or seven centuries ago is a matter for conjecture in that these Aborigines were peaceful children of the dawn and not hostile in their physical characteristics. It has also been advanced that a possible solution of this might have been the sudden appearance on this peninsula of a strong hostile band from old Mexico or the Aztecs from Yucatan, and no one knows but what threatened, and no one knows but what threatened with eventual extinction by a common enemy, the Abenakis took this precaution, making this the great central or focal point of defense for the last big stand. Indians of today refer to this spot as the Big Stand. From these fortifications, the Abenakis dug and completed a most remarkable canal, some two and a half miles in length, communicating with the Caloosahatchee River, and used by them, no doubt, with their canoes or rafts. Because of this canal, and the fact that these Aborigines were of sufficient constructive genius to formulate engineering projects of such magnitude in a primitive area, utterly unlike evidences of handiwork or skill found of or pertaining to any other aborigines, the inference is drawn that these projects were planned as a means to an end, as great storehouses for the preservation of food supplies on higher ground, guarding against rising waters and famine. Yet scientists cannot determine the exact psychology of the undertaking because of its antiquity. An examination of this canal, two and a half miles in length, will reveal to the close observer the handiwork of skilled artisans, and it was built well. When one considers in those primeval times the children of the dawn had only the crudest of instruments or implements with which to construct evidences of their thrift and forethought, 
it will be observed that every particle of earth, clay, and lime was transferred with hand implements found here. And there, to this day, relics that would make the modern steam shovel take a day's vacation to enjoy the blank of hearty laughter. The children of the dawn had their Solomon, their wise men, and they, like others of biblical times, evidently felt the necessity of providing for the lean years that came when the sun worshippers for days and weeks had no light except at intervals by which to pay their silent tribute with their faces bowed to the morning's birth. One may find evidences of the Abenakis, but only along the eastern coast, the sunrise strip of land along the continent from the shores of North Carolina where they roamed in the summer long ago to the tropical shores of the east coast of Florida. This canal is a subject of primary interest. It is secondary only to the great amphitheater of the Abenakis adjoining the U.S. lighthouse at Jupiter, built to accommodate 5,000 men and women gathered, as the ancient Romans did, to watch their outdoor sports and athletic diversions of feats of prowess or strength. The adobe clay of the old Spanish missions in California has not endured the ravages of time, as well as the construction work of the Abenakis along this prehistoric canal. The Golden West makes much in song and story of its old missions and relics, yet Florida has but scratched the surface of the mystic wonders it possesses, far outclassing Western lore in prehistoric value and real significance." End quote. The Miami Daily News of Tuesday, August 18, 1936, reported the following. Race of giants believed once living in Miami. First sheriff told about large bones unearthed here in Spanish War. Recent press reports of the unearthing of a giant skeleton off Cape Sable by a party of treasure hunters recalls a story told by the late W. M. Mater of Little River, Dade County's first elected sheriff, of the discovery in Brickle Hammock of a group of giant skeletons. As I remember it, Mater said, the thigh bones of the skeletons extended the length of the thigh bone of a large man today and about halfway between the knee and ankle, and the arm bone extended the length of the upper arm and to midway of the forearm." End quote. Mater said the discovery was made during excavation for some buildings in 1898 for the use of United States troops, then quartered in Miami, preparatory to going to Cuba to participate in the war with Spain. The skeletons buried just below the surface were reburied. There were six or eight of them, he recalled. The New Smyrna, the New Smyrna News of August 29, 1913, reported the following. Relics of men of huge size discovered in the glades. Thigh bone found indicates early residents of swamps were of magnificent proportion. Who were the men of stature so great that a thigh bone measured 38 inches in length? Men who once roamed the Everglades of Florida. And how many years ago did people of so great size become extinct? Asks the Palm Beach County. J.F. Carlisle and J.T. Brown of this city were straggling around in the glades the first of the week, noticing the effect of the unusual dry season and essaying to locate a special tract of land. They were some 80 miles west of this city, in a little north. Suddenly, they noticed upon a pine that was about three feet through an indication of a blaze, and investigation showed that at one time it was heavily and well defined. But time had healed over much of it, that less than two inches remained, and its height from the base of the tree was unusual, its lowest portion about eight feet from the ground and its upper commencement between 10 and 11, showing that it must have been made from a boat when three or four feet of water covered the spot by a person standing upon some object, or by a person of unusual size. Hardly had the two ceased wondering at the almost covered blaze when a little way from the base of the tree was found what bore every indication of being a thigh bone of a human being, except that its length was abnormal. It measured as it lay upon the ground, 38 inches long, but every effort to preserve it intact proved of no use, 
It crumbled at every touch. Both Mr. Brown and Mr. Carlyle are ready to make the affidavit as to the length and believe it to be the bone of a human leg from thigh to knee. The party brought home what is supposed to be a very ancient pot made of clay and very cleverly formed and finished. It has a capacity of from three pints to two quarts of fluid and shows marks of fire. An ornament made of a lightweight rock or of burnt clay was also brought home. This was doubtless a neck ornament for Indians in the ages long past, as it is ribbed so that it could be suspended by a thong. Both articles were found near the thigh bone. The two are being shown in the window of A.L. Hawes' store. End quote. The Palm Beach Post of November 20th, 1938 reported the following. Traded in fish. Here the Indians settled in large colonies and carried on their trade in fish and oysters. The Florida oyster shell beds have long been a mystery to modern civilization. They raise the question how so many millions of oyster shells could be piled in heaps at certain spots, and there are several of these mounds in and around the St. Lucie Territory at Jensen. For the curious who want to study this problem, there are a dozen at Jupiter Light, a short distance from Jensen. One of these Indian mounds, not far from Jensen, yielded nearly 50 skeletons of seven-foot men, and it was estimated that nearly a thousand bodies were buried. A thousand bodies were buried here, probably after a battle. So anyone may take up the study at his leisure, and they will find it interesting. For anglers, for trailerites, for campers, and yes, for anyone who enjoys the outdoors, where nature provides beautiful scenery and healthful living, Jensen has much to offer. End quote. The Palm Beach Post reported the following on October 4th, 1934. Quote, the continental wash of the Atlantic Ocean cutting through a narrow coastal island about one mile south of St. Lucie Inlet has exposed the bones of men, evidently laid to rest hundreds of years ago, says the Fort Pierce News Tribune. Skeletons of nine individuals were discovered, some in the shallow waters of the inlet and others beneath nearby sand. All of the men were unusually tall and must have been sturdy giants in their day. One jawbone taken from the site measured eight and a half inches from the joint of the jaw to where it hinged on the skull. One shin bone was almost twice the length of the ordinary shin bone of today. Some of the bones have Indian characteristics, while others are said by scientists to be the bones of white men, probably early explorers, the News Tribune says." End quote. The Stuart Daily News of September 15, 1934, also reported the following. Discover bones of giants near St. Lucie Inlet. Race of seven-foot men once lived or visited in this section. Sea reveals bones. Gomez men make discovery which may prove valuable. This section of the Florida East Coast was once visited or inhabited by a race of giants, none of one group recently exhumed, near here being under seven feet in height. That astounding fact, oft stated in Florida history, has been reproven by the discovery of bones of men of giant stature at Old St. Lucie Inlet, about one mile south of the present inlet. Like similar discoveries along the Florida East Coast, this burial pit, discovered by Howard Perry of Gomez, contains bones of men uniformly taller than present-day residents. One jawbone in the local burial pit measures eight and a half inches from the point of the jaw to where it hinged on the skull. One shin bone was twice the length of the shin bone of today's average Floridian. Repeat, twice the length of the shin bone of today's average Floridian. Skeletons of nine individuals have been unearthed so far, some in the shallow waters and some in the sand. One skull was so firmly embedded in the roots of a palm tree that it was disinterred with great difficulty. Scientists say that seven of these were white men and two were Indians. All of the nine were over seven feet tall. What manner of white men were these? And what were they doing on the coast of Florida? 
What strange tale of early adventure may be unearthed when this burial pit is finally explored? It seems unbelievable, but measurements of the skeletons prove that each of these ancient men was so tall that, alive today, he would have been a sideshow attraction, towering a foot or more above the tallest of his fellow men. Dale Noyes of Gomez has been working with Perry in exposing the skeletons which they have taken to West Palm Beach for study by scientists of that city. Perry owns a farm and grove at Gomez, and Noyes is owner of a place nearby." End quote. The following article, which I have not been able to source, but rest assured it is a real article, describes giants being found in the spring water of Silver Springs, Florida. And I quote, Giant's bones found in Florida. Remains of what is believed to have been a prehistoric race of American giants were discovered not long ago by divers who descended to the bottom of Silver Springs near Ocala, Florida. The human skeletons were found in a submerged burial chamber, were so large that persons who viewed them expressed the belief that the men of the primitive race attained a height of seven feet. Along with the bones, said to have lain undisturbed for 2,500 years, were discovered many tools, weapons, and ornaments. Among the finds were clay pots and idols, bone needles, flint arrows, flint arrowheads, and fragments of jewelry. The springs also yielded one relic of more recent date, a 17th century flintlock musket that may have been used by a Spanish explorer. A search for mastodon fossils led to the discovery of the human remains as the exploration was continued in the depths of the springs. End quote. The Dauphin Eagle of August 29, 1934, reported the following. Skeletons of lost race unearthed near Silver Springs. Tragic fate of American Aboriginal family disclosed in tomb of aged man and young woman of over 2,000 years ago, found by CCC workers in Ocala National Forest. Skulls of man left and woman right antedating Temucua Nation inhabiting Florida upon discovery of America. Note the worn teeth probably denoting age and the fracture at the base of the man's skull, and the better teeth, higher forehead, and absence of orbital ridges on woman's. Skeleton of young woman, six feet tall, and of massive build belonging to that mysterious, prehistoric people known as the Florida Colossus. Silver Springs, Florida. Recent exploration of Florida shell mounds as a federal emergency relief project has disclosed much additional and heretofore unrecorded data on that mysterious race of mound builders inhabiting the peninsula from 2,000 to 5,000 years ago which in turn has led to varied conjecture as to their appearance and origin. Most pronounced of these theories is that they were white. Indeed, there is a basis for the supposition of a white race in America before Columbus. Aside from Viking and Peruvian Inca legends, are the people described by Lucas Vasquez de Ayon in 1520 as the Duhara occupying a country of the same name along the Florida coast. He described them as exceedingly light in color, of gigantic stature, and having abundant hair. They may have been identical with the Ais and Tequesta, rude and fierce tribes inhabiting the east coast below Cape Canaveral, whose language was different and who were distinct from the Temucua and Calusa, holding the remainder of the peninsula. The Indians themselves had a legend of a tribe of redheads, known in their own language as rabbit men, residents residing along the Texas coast. Be that as it may, the Florida remains appear the oldest found so far in the Western Hemisphere, and a discovery by workers of the Civilian Conservation Corps in the Ocala National Forest a few miles east of Silver Springs sheds new light upon the family of this people of the dawn. An ancient tragedy involving an American Aboriginal group or family has been disclosed in a burial chamber 
estimated to be more than 2,000 years old. Discovered recently by CCC workers in the Ocala National Forest near Silver Springs. Two skulls, intact together with other skeletal remains, were removed from the burial chamber before the shell bank into which the men were tunneling caved in and halted further excavating. One of the skulls is that of an aged man who was killed by a blow upon the head. The other is the skull of a comparatively young woman, six feet tall. That is all that is known of this couple of early Americans who antedated by many centuries the Indians inhabiting this country upon discovery of America. Who they were and how they lived remain sealed in the mysteries of ages past. They were identical with the so-called Florida Colossus, although the latter seemed to have only been slightly taller than the average height, but of more massive bone structure than any known or existing races. The worn condition of the teeth show that the man was of advanced age when he met his death. That he died of a skull fracture is evidenced by the outward bulge of the bone. If the skull had been broken after death, the fracture would have been made concave. The almost perfect state of the woman's death indicate that she died in youth. Her skull is of a much higher type than the man's, having a smooth and lofty forehead, as compared to the low and beetling brow of the man. With exception of three missing front teeth, her teeth are in an excellent state of preservation. Two of the missing teeth appear from the root cavities to have been lost while the subject was still alive, while the third one seems to have been broken off later. What is the significance of the missing front teeth? Did they denote the domestic status of wife or slave? And were they knocked out by the old man with whom she was buried as a mark of servitude to consummate her marriage or subjugation to him? The higher type of the female skull points to a racial distinction between the pair, which finds plausible explanation in the theory that the woman may have been slain or buried alive with her husband upon his death, in battle or in combat, with a private enemy, a custom still practiced in some quarters of the globe. CCC boys who discovered the ancient tomb said that a third and somewhat larger skull was destroyed by one of their number upon being taken to a nearby stream to wash it. From their description, it appears that the lost skull was of the same superior type as the female cranium. It may have been that of another wife buried with the aged man or chieftain to accompany him, in the superstitious belief of his tribesmen upon his journey to the great beyond. All three skeletons were found in sitting posture facing west which shows they were buried with due ceremony and not after the manner of slain enemies following a raid. Furthermore, they were found interred in the center of the immense village mound of snail shells at the head of Silver Glen Springs. Remains of two other such village sites border the creek or run connecting Silver Glen Springs with Lake George. Upon one of these village mounds sits the lodge house of the Juniper Hunting Club, Composed of Louisville, Kentucky, people headed by Judge Robert W. Bingham, U.S. Ambassador to Great Britain and publisher of the Louisville Courier Journal. The Silver Glen Mounds show evidence of great antiquity, not only from the standpoint of the great accumulation of snail shells or kitchen middens, but also from the successive changes in species of shell between the bottom and higher strata and the giant palms and live oaks growing upon the mounds. Although comparatively little is known of the ancient race of mound builders, scientific exploration of the mounds has established conclusively that they were cannibals and practiced human sacrifice. According to the Handbook of American Indians, published by the U.S. Bureau of Ethnography, they were agricultural to a limited extent and tilled the ground with instruments of bone and shell attached to staves, arrowheads with holes near the points found at Silver Glen Springs lead to their belief that they poisoned their arrows. Coincident with the discovery of the burial chamber at Silver Glen was the unearthing of a skeleton on Kaufman's Island in Lake Kerr, a few miles away. H. A. Kaufman, who lives a Robinson Crusoe life on the island, declared it 
the tenth skeleton to be taken from a small burial mound on the island. The last skeleton was found intact with arms folded across the chest and legs crossed. The Kaufman Island skeletons differ from those at Silver Glen having been buried in a prone position and being, with one exception, of small stature. The single exception was seven feet tall. On the chest of the last one taken from the Kaufman Island mound was a circular decoration of carved shell bearing the emblem of an eight-pointed star enclosing a Greek cross. Portions of the two skeletons found at Silver Glen were easily identified as those of the aged man and youthful woman by similarity in coloration and other qualities of the bone to their respective skulls, while the shoulder blades, pelvis, and part of the vertebra of the woman are missing. Her approximate height can be computed from the remainder of the skeleton. Only thigh, shank, and arm bones of the man were found, but as the femurs were somewhat longer and heavier than the woman's, his height is estimated to have been about seven feet. A doll or idol of baked clay found in the Kaufman Island mound represents a nude figure with the hair worn long, done in a coil over the right ear. The pose is effeminate with one arm, akimbo, and the other outstretched. The woman wore large labrets in holes pierced through the lips. Among the articles of primitive culture found in the vicinity are beads of pearl, rolled copper, shell and other material, bone needles, and large pots of baked clay. Embalming was practiced to a limited degree. The dead usually were buried prone. Several valuable gold ornaments have also been taken from mounds in Sumter County on the south. The gold and copper are presumed to have been obtained in trade from Mexico. Indeed, the affinity of Florida Indians to those of South and Central America is everywhere apparent, and there is every reason to believe that they were in contact with Yucatan and Cuba from the earliest period." End quote. The Miami Herald of September 1st, 1934, reported the following. White race in Florida may predate Indian. This article goes on to cover much of the same information. The Miami Herald of February 25th, 1934, similarly related the following. Indian shell mounds yield clues to past. Burial places in region of Silver Springs are object of research. Quote, in the numerous burial mounds may be found the skeletons of that much debated Florida Colossus, and whether a race of giants, as many contend, were merely a people of more than ordinary stature, as scientists are inclined to believe. The remains speak for themselves." End quote. The skeletons show the ancient Floridians were tall of stature, with larger bones than are found among other Indian remains or existing races. The Tampa Sunday Times of September 6, 1914, reported the following. Bones of real giants found. Extraordinary discoveries near St. Pete. Skeletons of men over seven feet high said to have been dug up in mounds. Quote, That a huge race of men, giants in fact, once lived on the western shores of the Florida Peninsula is being established by Professor J. W. Platt of the Corps of Southland Seminary, from the results of excavations which are being conducted by the seminary into shell mounds near the Seminole Bridge, nine miles from St. Petersburg. Bones of humans, indicating that the people who lived on the peninsula probably thousands of years ago were of more than ordinary size, have been dug out of the mounds, and the excavators are constantly making new and important finds. From calculations made by Professor Platt, comparing the size of the bones found deep down in some of the mounds to the size of the bones of the ordinary man of present day, the conclusion is reached that the average person of that age was over seven feet in height. The first of the large bones was discovered some months ago by a gang of laborers who were digging shell from one of the mounds for use on the country roads. Several bones of extraordinary size were uncovered, and then a portion of a skeleton, 
The skull of the first skeleton found in the mound was brought to the offices of the seminary and compared with an ordinary sized skull, the one from the mound being several sizes the larger. The jawbone would fit loosely over the face of a large man, and a large hat would not cover the skull, except with the tightest kind of a fit. These things led to a great interest here in the mounds, and what they might hold, and Professor Platt, who was spending his vacation in central Florida, was summoned to the city to undertake the investigations for the seminary. He arrived some weeks ago, and first went with two companions to the mounds, where he made some superficial investigations, satisfying himself that the great banks of shells held rare secrets. Several feet below the present surface of the earth, a hundred or so feet from the bayou, which is spanned by the Seminole Bridge, after digging through a thick layer of shells, have been found crude pieces of pottery, different from that usually found in mounds hereabouts. Always with the pottery are found bones, most of them exceptionally large. One of them, a human leg bone, is 21 inches long, but this is an exceptionally large one. The skulls unearthed are all over the average size, and the other bones are correspondingly large. Professor Platt is now making investigations in several different places around the bayou and a number of mounds have been opened. Near the top of the mounds, or above the earth's surface, are found bones above the size of those of the ordinary person, but in digging deeper, it is found that they run gradually to larger sizes until several feet below the surface they are of really extraordinary size. Professor Platt believes that he will be able, after the excavations have gone further, to assemble a complete skeleton, which will be remarkable for its size. As far as he knows, there is no knowledge of a large race of people in this part of the continent, though researchers in other sections have developed this for a fact. The St. Petersburg Times of September 20th, 1925 reported the following. Mounds may unlock mystery. Tight-lipped tomb holds ancient secret of strange aborigines who left queer traces of culture in shell catacombs. Science is groping for final link to fix identity. Customs are traced. Quote, 1,000 skeletons found. Approximately 1,000 skeletons have been unearthed in and around St. Petersburg. Some of the mounds lie undisturbed and will be preserved for centuries. Other have yielded their contents and are neglected except for the occasional visit of a winter tourist. Somewhere in the giant mound lying in the midst of a St. Petersburg park may be the key to the mystery. The ancient tribes who roamed this section, eating fish and piling up their dead under the shells, may have left their history here. If so, the missing link will never be uncovered. Most of the skeletons found in Pinellas County and this immediate section have come from Whedon Island, which is now being developed into a residential section. We skip ahead. None of the American Indians have been found to be cannibalistic. Scientists say the bones were charred during ceremonies and not by the teeth. Members of the early tribes were characterized by being small with unusually little bones. Their chins were pointed. The third type, which was discovered, led scientists to believe they were giants with large bones and features. Members of this race were the last to occupy Whedon's Island. They are thought to have lived there about 450 or 500 years ago. That they were the most cultured of the three tribes is believed due to the fact that the pottery is of intricate design. The Fort Myers Press of July 19, 1927, reported the following. Giant skeletons are uncovered by island fishermen at Tampa. Giant Indians who roamed Florida swamps 500 years or more, living on shell foods which they cracked with their teeth, is a picture unfolded by archaeologists who have delved into a burial ground on a gulf island here. The skeletons were discovered on a small section of island where a lone fisherman has lived for years. Scientists estimated 
The bones are at least 500 years old and are remains of a tribe known as the Caribs, natives of the West Indies. They are believed to have inhabited the state and adjacent islands before the arrival of Spaniards in Florida. The skulls, larger than those of current history, battered and crushed, indicated tribal battles. The jaw and teeth are unusually large. Likewise are the body bones, indicating the Indians of past ages were veritable giants in comparison with those of today. Mounds similar to the one in which the bones were unearthed are common in the state. The bones have been sent to the Smithsonian Institute for further examination, of course. End quote. The St. Petersburg Daily Times of Thursday, August 13th, 1914, reported the following. Race of giants once inhabited this peninsula. Mounds near Seminole Bridge give up bones of mammoth people. Must have been nine feet tall. Professor Pratt of Southland Seminary makes preliminary investigation and may excavate extensively. That the shell mounds at the end of the Seminole Bridge closest to St. Petersburg, if dug into, would reveal skeletons of a tribe of men about which little is known is the opinion of Professor J. H. Pratt of Southland Seminary, who yesterday visited the mounds and dug into a few. Skulls and bones taken from them several weeks ago by a party of men were shown Professor Pratt, and it is pr- were shown to Professor Pratt, and it is probable that at a later date a thorough excavation will be made in search of traces of a race of people yet little heard of. Yesterday, on account of poor facilities for excavating, little digging was done. The trip being made primarily to allow the professor to establish to himself whether the mounds were worth going into. He is confident that where the giant piles of shell on this side of the bayou spanned by the Seminole Bridge was once the site of an Indian village of some size, and that if excavations were made, many skeletons would be found, as well as pieces of pottery, implements of the chase and warfare, and other things intimate with the life of the Aborigines. Some time ago, when shell was being taken from one of the mounds for road work, two complete skeletons were found, besides a number of separate bones. One of these, a leg bone, was two feet and some inches in length. Comparing this length with the length of the bone of the leg of man six feet tall would establish the fact that the race of Indians who once lived in these parts, probably hundreds of years ago, were giants as a man would have to be over nine feet tall to have a leg bone two feet long. This fact coupled with the ex- This fact coupled with the extraordinary size of some of the skulls dug up brings about the assumption that a race of abnormally large people inhabited this peninsula, and it is likely blank effort will be made to unearth more skeletons at an early date. Numerous shell mounds on the Pinellas Peninsula have been opened and many treasures of the Indian days have been unearthed. Around St. Petersburg, there are a number of such mounds, many of which have been opened a number of times. Odd pieces of pottery, weapons, and bones, sometimes whole skeletons, have been taken out and the fact is well established that this section was thickly populated with Indians." End quote. The Tampa Daily Times reported the following on December 19, 1922. Physical Characteristics As to the physical characteristics of the Florida population at the advent of the white, there are only a small number of references, and these are of very little, if any, value. Cabeza de Vaca, writing of his trip to Florida with Navarez in 1527, reports the Floridians to be wonderfully well-built, spare, very strong and very swift, adding that, being so tall and going about nude, they look like giants from a distance. Lucas Vasquez de Ayon and Le Moyne each speak of having seen giant-like caciques, the former adding, for good measure, that in the case of his cacique, which means king, by the way, the giantism had been produced artificially by the Indians, these and similar reports on the Muscogees, the Indians of South Carolina, etc., 
influenced more than one subsequent author, among whom no less been a critic than Brinton, who in his Floridian Peninsula, page 171, speaking of skeletons from a mound on Long Key, Sarasota Bay, reports having been assured by an intelligent gentleman of manatee that some of these were of astonishing size and must have belonged to men seven or eight feet in height. Which statement, Brinton adds, is not so incredible as it may appear at first sight. Quoting some other reports of that nature from other parts of the continent, and the giant and eight-foot skeleton is to this day the almost stereotyped feature of many an amateur report of a find or skeletal remains from Florida, as well as other parts of the country. The following article was provided to me by Analog from the Archivist channel on YouTube. Quote, Some bones found in these mounds are huge, indicating gigantic stature. But the Indian understood the law of the land, and the royal races in Florida were Anakims, seven or eight feet in stature. End quote. To give us some context as to the name Anakim, we will read from AnswersInGenesis.org. Quote, the Anakim were mentioned in several of these passages. They were perhaps the best known of the giants dwelling in the land of Canaan at the time of the Exodus. As stated in the verse above, they were part of the Nephilim. If Nephilim simply refers to giants in general, then the Anakim are just said to be giants in Numbers 13.33, which is consistent with their description in this passage. So, the Amorites and other giant people would also be Nephilim. If Nephilim refers to a particular giant tribe, then the Anakim were part of this line. Numbers 13.22 states that Ahiman, Sheshe, and Talme were descendants of Anak, who was obviously the namesake of the Anakim. Both the Amim and Zamzumim were compared to the Anakim, as they were both, quote, a people as great and numerous and tall as the Anakim, end quote. Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 10 and 21, and chapter 9, verse 2, end quote. Something that people always neglect to realize is that the word Anak backwards is Kana and thus where we get Canaan and the Canaanites. This is likely the source for the name of the Abenaki people as well, as the words like Anunnaki. Part 2. European Contact For those who may suspect that turn-of-the-century newspaper articles about giants were the product of an age of yellow journalism, I will have you know that every measurement given in these accounts is substantiated, if not surpassed, by the first-hand accounts of the European forces who first explored Florida, allegedly, in the early 1500s. When the Spanish landed on the Florida Peninsula, the men of Florida they first encountered averaged a full foot taller than themselves. The following is relayed to us from the expedition of Panfilo de Narvarez. Quote, a people so handsome as I have seen. The Indians are all archers. Ruefully reported a survivor of the 1528 Spanish march into northwestern Florida. They appear at a distance like giants. The bows they use are as thick as the arm. They will discharge them at 200 paces with so great precision that they miss nothing. Tamuku and Bowman, nearly invisible behind trees, retaliated firing at stragglers with deadly effect. Their reed arrows, tipped with snake teeth, bone, or flint, penetrated six inches of wood, or skewered from side to side, soldiers in chain mail. Let us now discuss what is perhaps the most reliable, unbiased account of 1500s Florida available to the public. Florida of the Inca, by Garcilaso de la Vega also known as the Inca. This book, published in 1605, details the doomed De Soto expedition of the southeast United States between 1539 and 1543. 
The word Inca is used in its title because of the fact that the author slash chronicler is, himself, a member of the royal Inca family, and many of the men who served on this expedition were Inca themselves. De Soto's exploits in the Inca Empire had resulted in Inca men fighting alongside the conquistadors in their future expeditions, primarily that of De Soto and Florida. The reason this matters is that the account given in this book is both factual and impartial. The nationality of the author denotes a general familiarity with the New World, and thus lessens the chance of exaggeration brought about by exotic stimuli. There are no mentions in this book of mermaids, sea monsters, holy grails, etc. There are, however, explicit examples given for men of giant stature. Having read this book recently, myself, I will relay to you the relevant portions. The first half of the book makes little mention of giants, but clearly establishes the average height of the common Floridian to be over six inches taller than Europeans. About halfway through the book, however, we are introduced to Chief Tuscaloosa of what was likely modern-day Mobile, Alabama, and I quote, Book 3, Chapter 24. The fierce Curaca, Tazcaloosa, who was almost a giant, and the manner in which he received the governor. Meanwhile, there came to him a son of Tazcaloosa, a boy of eighteen years, and of such goodly stature, that from the chest up he was taller than any Spaniard or Indian in the entire army. The physical measurements of Tazcaloosa were like those of his son, for both were more than a half-yard taller or a foot and a half, than all the others. He appeared to be a giant, or rather was one, and his limbs and face were in proportion to the height of his body. His countenance was handsome, and he wore a look of severity, yet a look which well revealed his ferocity and his grandeur of spirit. His shoulders conformed to his height, and his waistline measured just a little more than two-thirds of a yard. His arms and legs were straight and well-formed, and were in proper proportion to the rest of his body. In sum, he was the tallest and most handsomely shaped Indian that the Castilians saw during all their travels in Florida. The governor thereupon commanded that a horse be bridled for the cacique to ride, for he had always provided mounts for the Curacas, lords of vassals who traveled with him, although we have forgotten to make mention of this fact until now. But no beast could be found among all those in the army capable of carrying the chieftain because of his great size. Not that he was fat, for as we have said already, he had less than a yard of girth. Nor was he heavy because of age, for he was hardly forty years old. Finally, however, after making additional efforts to locate a suitable animal, the Castilians did find a nag belonging to the governor, which because of its strength was used as a pack horse and thus was able to bear the weight of the cacique. But the Indian was so tall that when mounted, not even a quarter of a yard remained between his feet and the ground. Alonso de Carmona, in his handwritten notes, gives a very lengthy account of the journey that he made with those Spaniards from the province of Cofachiqui to that of Coza, and he tells of the grandeurs of the latter province as well as the generosities of its lord. And concerning the stature of Tazcaloosa, he asserts that this man lacked very little of being a giant, and that he was excellently featured. Juan Colez, too, has the following to say of this strong and robust individual. When we had arrived in the province of the Lord Tazcaloosa, he came out to us in peace. He was a mighty man, who had as much bone between his foot and his knee as another very large person might have between his foot and his waist. His eyes were like those of an ox, and along the road he traveled upon a horse, but the horse was unable to sustain him." End quote. Further on in this book, we actually find an account of an entirely different race of American giants, this time at the mouth of the Mississippi River. Quote, book 6, Chapter 10 a battle that the Spaniards had with the Indians of the coast. Then in the afternoon of the third day, 
they caught sight of seven canoes setting out toward them from some rushes, and in the first of these canoes they beheld an Indian very different in aspect and color from those they had left inland, for he was as large as a Philistine and as black as an Ethiopian. End quote. Let us again read from AnswersInGenesis.org to better understand the term Philistine. Quote, of course, the most renowned giant was the mighty Philistine slain by David. Here is how he is described in Scripture. And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines, named Goliath, from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail. And the weight of the coat was five thousand shekels of bronze, and he had bronze armor on his legs and a bronze javelin between his shoulders. Now the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his iron spearhead weighed six hundred shekels, and a shield-bearer went before him. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 4-7 through seven. Notice that Goliath was from Gath, which happened to be one of the three places where Anakim remained, according to Joshua, Chapter 11, verses 21 through 22. So although he is not called one in Samuel 17, it is possible that Goliath was a descendant of the Anakim who mixed with the Philistine population in that area. End quote. Goliath's height of approximately nine feet lines up precisely with that of the royal races of Florida. In 1557, Pedro de Santander wrote the following to his Spanish king in persuasion of further expeditions to Florida. Quote, it is lawful that your majesty, like a good shepherd appointed by the hand of the Eternal Father, should tend and lead out your sheep, since the Holy Spirit has shown spreading pastures whereon are feeding lost sheep, which have been snatched away by the dragon, the demon. These pastures are the new world, wherein is comprised Florida, now in possession of the demon, and here he makes himself adored and revered. This is the land of promise, possessed by idolaters, the Amorite, Amalekite, Moabite, and Canaanite. This is the land promised by the Eternal Father to the faithful, since we are commanded by God in the Holy Scriptures to take it from them. Being idolaters, and, by reason of their idolatry and sin, to put them all to the knife, leaving no living thing save maidens and children, their cities robbed and sacked, their walls and houses leveled to the earth." End quote. To better understand the terms Amorite, Amalekite, Moabite, and Canaanite, let us read from AnswersInGenesis.org. Old Testament Giants one of the earliest mentions of giants in the Bible is found in Genesis 14. Genesis 14 does not reveal that the Amorites were giants, but this information can be found in other places. The Amorites are mentioned more than 80 times in Scripture, and early on, some were allied with Abraham. They were descendants of Noah's grandson, Canaan or Canaan. While the Amorites are mentioned in the same context as other giants a few times, they are specifically described as giants in the Minor Prophets. Quote, Yet it was I who destroyed the Amorite before them, whose height was like the height of the cedars, and he was as strong as the oaks. Yet I destroyed his fruit above and his roots beneath. Also it was I who brought you up from the land of Egypt and led you forty years through the wilderness to possess the land of the Amorite. Amos chapter 2 verses 9 through 10. Through Amos, God clearly stated that the Amorites were generally very tall and strong. Some may downplay the description of the Amorites in this passage, since these verses employ figurative language. But there are some good reasons to take this passage in a straightforward manner. The idea that the Amorites were giants is supposed by the report of the spies who Moses sent through the land of Canaan. The Amorites were one of the people groups they saw. And they claimed that, quote, all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. Numbers chapter 13 verse 32. It is telling that in their response, 
Joshua and Caleb did not challenge the size of the land's inhabitants. Between 1562 and 1565, hundreds of French Huguenots lived in Florida among its natives. In contrast to the Spanish de Soto expedition, these French are said to have only established positive relations with the natives of Florida, as they allegedly brought no slaves with them and took none during their stay. The following can be found in Theodore de Bry's engravings of these French expeditions. Quote, this chief Athor is an extremely handsome man, intelligent, reliable, strong, of exceptional height, exceeding our tallest man by a foot and a half, and endowed with a certain restrained dignity, so that in him a remarkable majesty shone forth." End quote. I have found evidence indicating that the tallest Frenchman on this expedition stood around six foot three. This would place Chief Athor at almost eight feet tall. Even in a scenario where the tallest Frenchman was only five foot six, this would still make Chief Athor seven feet tall. While here, the chief is depicted about six inches taller than the Frenchman, the engraver himself was not present to see this man. He is merely illustrating the words of another and seems to have erred on the side of modesty. This height differential of six inches is more indicative of the average Frenchman compared to the common Floridian of the time, not Chief Athor, who was clearly said to have stood an additional foot taller than depicted here. Part 3. Architects of America While these first-hand European accounts of walking, talking giants are impressive by themselves, I must remind the viewer that the royal races of Florida may have only represented the most recent iteration of America's giants, and thus the shortest. The tallest Floridians that Europeans would have had the privilege of encountering were only the ones small enough to integrate and ultimately reproduce with women of average stature. The ancestors of those giants must have been even larger than they, titanic perhaps. The handiwork of these titans can be observed to this day in the form of the pyramids, mounds, earthworks, megaliths, canals, etc., scattered across the Americas. This reality has perhaps been best summarized in the words of Florida's very own 1936 Republican candidate for governor, E. E. Calloway, quote, With the exception of the Aztecs, we have erroneously assumed that all the peoples who lived in the Western Hemisphere before the white man came here were Indians. We now know that is not true, but that a large, non-warlike people lived here even before the Indians and that their physical attributes, habits, and manner of living were as different from the Indians as the Indians differ from the white man. We have also erroneously assumed that this is the New World, and that Asia is the Old World. From the skeletons of the giants and evidence of their great works in Mexico and Peru, and from the ancient temples and ruins of the Western Hemisphere, I am convinced that the genesis of man was in the Western Hemisphere, and not in Asia. Some of the skeletons uncovered in the Western Hemisphere became skeletons before man learned the art of embalming or mummifying." End quote. Let us again reference the article provided to us by Analog from the Archivist Channel. Quote, the characteristic of the artificial topography of the Florida tribes was a high pyramidal mound, an earth form resembling the Mexican Teocalis and the Egyptian pyramids near a lake or river and having stately avenues leading up to it or to an artificial reservoir, strangely suggesting that artificial irrigation seen in the New Mexican Aquias and a period when a powerful Indian nationality unbroken by physical cataclysms or rebellious heed in populous civilization, all the southern states between the two seas. Indeed, Bristow's narrative, published in 1656 and describing the mountain of 
Olaimi, lifting its barren, round summit above the holy of Melilot at its base, is a sufficiently accurate description of the Indian city and a rock of Luni. As remarkable as the pyramidal mounds and artificial lakes are the highways, about 50 yards wide, sunk a little below the common level, and the earth thrown up on each side, making a bank about two feet high. From the St. John's to the Keys, these mounds, reservoirs, and highways were visible a few years ago. There are such mound cities near Lake Monroe and Lake Harney, besides those on Lake George. Blue or white glass beads are found, and small earthenware pyramid of triangular bases suggesting some symbol allied to the pyramidal Teoculus. The northern tourist who expects to see these curiosities drifts over the slow, smooth rivers under picturesque foliage, and sees very little of them. To find them, one must penetrate the hummocks and have an educated eye to detect the difference between a natural and an artificial elevation." End quote. In addition to the plethora of colossal earthworks in Florida and the southeast United States, we find another nail in the coffin as to the presence of abnormally large people in the Americas, that is, Florida's Saxer stones, a scattering of ancient stone anchors found across Florida with the highest concentration around the Tampa Bay area. The Saxer stones, named for the first man to identify them, John Saxer, differ from typical ancient stone anchors in two key areas. The first being that, while the ancient stone anchors found elsewhere in the world average between 50 and 300 pounds, the Saxer stones average between 1,000 and 10,000 pounds. Modern-sized men would be incapable of deploying anchors of this size. The boats which would have utilized these stones would have been on par with Noah's Ark and the aircraft carriers of today's modern militaries. While many are quick to label these stones as mooring stones, due to their unbelievable size, I can dispel this in a number of different ways. I would implore the listener, however, to research drogue stones, as drogue stone may be a more accurate title than anchor. Nonetheless, if you haven't already, make sure to check out my Saxer Stones and Saxer Saga videos to learn more about the ancient stone anchors of Atlantis. Part 4. Giants Among Us While tribes like the Temucua may be extinct, there is some evidence to show that they simply shrank while assimilating into other relocated tribes. Starting in the 1600s, with the implementation of the Spanish mission system, there was a well-documented drop in the height of the average Floridian man from over 6 foot 6 to only 5 foot 6. Even this is nearly impossible to verify, as virtually every native inhabitant of the Florida Peninsula is said to have either been exterminated or died of disease. There is, however, a tribe of extraordinary stature which calls Florida home to this day. Men of the Seminole tribe of Florida stood an average of six foot four right up until they departed with their outdoor lifestyle in the 1960s. While the origin of the Seminole tribe is widely disputed, they can broadly be considered indigenous to the Gulf of Mexico area. Thus, they may very well be descendants of Florida's Children of the Dawn. The following comes to us from The Seminole Indians of Florida by Clay McCauley, 1887. Quote, Physique of the men. Physically, both men and women are remarkable. The men, as a rule, attract attention by their height, fullness and symmetry of development, and the regularity and agreeableness of their features. In muscular power and constitutional ability to endure, they excel. While these qualities distinguish, with a few exceptions, the men of the whole tribe, they are particularly characteristic of the two most widely spread of the families of which the tribe is composed. These are the tiger and otter 
clans, which, proud of their lines of descent, have been preserved through a long and tragic past with exceptional freedom from admixture with degrading blood. Today their men might be taken as types of physical excellence. The physique of every tiger warrior, especially I met, would furnish proof of this statement. The tigers are dark, copper-colored fellows over six feet in height, with limbs in good proportion, their hands and feet well-shaped and not very large, their stature erect, their bearing a sign of self-confident power, their movements deliberate, persistent, strong, their heads are large and their foreheads full and marked. An almost universal characteristic of the tiger's face is its squareness, a widened and protruding under jawbone giving this effect to it. Of other features, I noticed that under a large forehead are deep-set, bright, black eyes, small but expressive of inquiry and vigilance. The nose is slightly aquiline and sensitively formed about the nostrils. The lips are mobile, sensuous, and not very full, disclosing when they smile, beautiful regular teeth, and the whole face is expressive of the man's sense of having extraordinary ability to endure and to achieve. Two of the warriors permitted me to manipulate the muscles of their bodies. Under my touch, these were more like rubber than flesh. Noticeable among all are the large calves of their legs, the size of the tendons of the lower limbs, and the strength of their toes. I attribute this exceptional development to the fact that they are not what we would call horse Indians, and that they hunt barefoot over their wide domain. The same causes, perhaps, account for the only real deformity I noticed in the seminal physique, namely the diminutive toenails, and for their heavy, cracked and seamed skin which covers the soles of their feet. But regarded as a whole, in their physique, the seminal warriors, especially the men of the tiger and otter clans, are admirable. Even among the children, this physical superiority is seen to illustrate, a tall, slender boy, not quite twelve years old, shouldered a heavy Kentucky rifle, left our camp, and followed in his father's long footsteps for a day's hunt. After tramping all day, at sunset he reappeared in the camp, carrying slung across his shoulders, in addition to rifle and accouterments, a deer weighing perhaps fifty pounds, a weight he had borne for miles. The same boy, in one day, went with some older friends to his permanent home, twenty miles away, and returned. There are, as I have said, exceptions to this rule of unusual physical size and strength, but these are few, so few that, disregarding them, we may pronounce the seminal men handsome and exceptionally powerful." End quote. The following article which is featured in my Gulf of Mexico is the True Fertile Crescent video, goes into great detail listing the heights of many seminal men, establishing the fact that the average height of a seminal man around 1950 was around six foot four. A more controversial theory, one which my research supports to an extent, is the possibility that the genetics of America's giants have resurfaced in the professional sports leagues of this country. For there are many athletes in these leagues who are, quote, black as an Ethiopian and large as a Philistine, as remarked earlier regarding the natives of the Gulf of Mexico. It is no coincidence that the largest contributors of athletes to the NCAA, NBA, and NFL are Florida and Texas, the two states with the most Gulf of Mexico coastline. We also find the word Nephilim disguised as the acronym NFL, or rather Nephel, NFL as in Nephilim, Nephilim. It is no coincidence we find teams in this league with names like Tennessee Titans and New York Giants. The other two leagues require a bit more stretching, but are capable of yielding similar names. NCAA is an anagram for a knock or 
Cana, as in Canaan or Canaan. NBA backwards is Aben, A-B-N, Aben, the first half of the words Abenaki or Abenakis. As to why the royal races of Florida disappeared in the first place, being so large and dominant, that will have to be the focus of another video. We will, however, conclude with a quote from the autobiography of Buffalo Bill Cody. Quote, It was taught by the wise men of this tribe that the earth was originally peopled by giants, who were fully three times the size of modern men. They were so swift and powerful that they could run alongside a buffalo, take the animal under one arm, and tear off a leg, and eat it as they ran. So vainglorious were they, because of their own size and strength, that they denied the existence of a creator. When it lighted, they proclaimed their superiority to the lightning. When it thundered, they laughed. This displeased the Great Spirit, and to rebuke their arrogance, he sent a great rain upon the earth. The valleys filled with water, and the giants retreated to the hills. The water crept up the hills, and the giants sought safety on the highest mountains. Still, the rain continued. The waters rose, and the giants, having no other refuge, were drowned." End quote. Part 5. Why Would They Lie? Seeing as how we have covered so much and so little, I will keep part 5 of this presentation short and sweet. However, the answer to the question of why would they lie is actually very straightforward. Giant skeletons validate the Bible. They validate mythology. They debunk human evolution. They debunk dinosaurs. Giant skeletons in Florida debunk the Bering Strait migration theory. They make a fool of every academic that has failed to acknowledge them. But most importantly, giant skeletons implore man to rethink his existence, for his time on this earth is far from over, and he now has the largest of shoes to fill. God bless Florida, and long live the children of the dawn. <laughs>